Hey everybody, how's it going? Thanks for joining me this afternoon. I've got a great stream with a great guest that I think you're really going to enjoy. So a lot of people, they look at the 2020 election, all the shenanigans, all the fortification, all the controversy, or maybe they look back at the, the first election. I really remember, uh, you know, kind of getting into my political consciousness, uh, the 2000 election between Bush and Gore and the, the controversy of the hanging sh chads and things. And they think, these are unique events. You know, this is the, the rare time where these elections are contested and people don't know what's going to happen. But actually, it turns out there's a long history of, uh, let's say, disputed elections in the United States, some of which are far more disputed than even, let's say, those of 2020. And so I wanted to go ahead and talk about what might be the most disputed election in American history, which is the election of 1876. And joining me to do so is Mr. Ryan Turnipseed. He is a YouTuber with an excellent channel. And don't be deceived, despite his youthful appearance, he has an excellent knowledge for all kinds of forgotten American history. And it is incredibly helpful when we go over these kind of topics. Ryan, thank you for joining me. Uh, thank you very much for having me on. It's uh, good to be back, especially after the last stream that I did with you, which was uh, an absolute blast. Absolutely. Yeah, no, we always have a great time. I like to mix it up. You know, we get the, the political theory, we get the day to day stuff, but it's great to go back and get these historical podcasts because it's uh, all these times in America that people just have no clue about. They never get talked about in history classes. They never really get addressed. Or if they do, there's just a blurb in a book somewhere or Wikipedia. They never really get kind of the full explanation and they can give us much more context for kind of what is happening in America today. So we're going to get into uh, the controversy, the civil war, the everything leading up to the election itself, and then the compromise that kind of ends uh, the disputed election. But before we do all that, guys, let's hear from today's sponsor. If you're a person of faith, you'll love this. The Supreme Court recently overturned a 50-year-old legal precedent that permitted open hostility to public expression of faith. To get the word out, this calls for more public expressions of faith. The overturning precedent was cited when high school coach Joe Kennedy was fired from his job. His crime? Praying in public after games. It took seven years of court battles to get the precedent overturned and his job back. To celebrate, the people over at First Liberty Institute created the First Freedom Challenge. They want people to fill local stadiums and pray after the game, just like Coach Kennedy on his first game back Friday, September 1st. So what can you do to promote the First Freedom Challenge? One. Sign up at rfia.org and commit to praying on September 1st. Two, record a short video message challenging people to take a knee in prayer with Coach Kennedy. And three, share your video on social media. It's been decades since Americans enjoyed this level of freedom, so let's express our faith. Join me and take the First Freedom Challenge. Sign up at rfia.org. That's rfia.org. All right, so let's dive into the original freest and fairest election in American history, uh, the election of 1876. So, Ryan, to set the stage here, obviously we are post-Civil War. We're only 10 years removed from the Civil War. Lincoln is assassinated. This throws kind of the, the post-1865 political world into uh, disarray. They're not sure what's going to happen. You've obviously got his vice president who takes over. But after Johnson, you know, kind of takes over, uh, Grant is going to follow. And it 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 really uh, no one is sure how this kind of reconstruction is going to work. There are many who were advocates of kind of bringing the South right in after and, and trying to uh, make sure that they felt integrated back in the country. But there are others that wanted to punish the South uh, very thoroughly uh, for for trying to leave the Union. Uh, what kind of state are we in leading up to the election of 1876. Yeah, so um, since specifically since we're talking about the election, um, we can we can deal with the country in just a very general overview. I, if you want to know more, you can go out and find it in uh, troves. Um, so uh, the South has been basically impoverished. It had a war that it lost very badly, um, and it had a Reconstruction regime which was not conducive to uh, actually making a prosperous society. So. Um, one of the examples is that immediately after the war ended and the South was occupied, it was uh, the southern states were divided into uh, different reconstruction zones. So Texas and Louisiana was one zone, Virginia was its own. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think the Carolinas. Uh, you can uh, you can go and look at the maps yourselves. Um, and in these reconstruction zones, they were ran by various military governors, 
um, and they ruled very strictly and almost in a central planning-like manner. Um, central planning, uh, as most people know, um, is not conducive to making sure that people get what they need at the uh, correct times. Um, so there were quite a few famines early on in the South as uh, this reconstruction measures uh, were implemented. Um, there was a lot of uh, land redistribution as well. Anyone that is familiar with land reform, land redistribution throughout history, um, it typically decreases agricultural efficiency. Um, it turns out there's a reason that land tends to consolidate in these more successful farmers, um, and it's because they do better than the ones that didn't win uh, in the uh, sort of agricultural market game. Um, so when the uh, union starts dividing up former plantations and large land holdings to uh, various people in the, uh, in the South, blacks, poor whites, whoever else, uh, carpetbaggers, um, these people hadn't ran a farm before, leading to more famine, a uh, much greater scarcity of food, um, and this is all coupled with the fact that, uh, as he mentioned, Lincoln had been shot. Um, Lincoln would have been considered a moderate by his party's standards, if you can believe that. There are people in the South that absolutely hate him. Um, he was not in favor of necessarily punishing most of the southern states. Um, in fact, uh, Thomas D. Lorenzo makes a great point that he was mostly in it to make sure that the, uh, um, that the government did not uh, didn't lose, one, its uh, power projection, and two, didn't lose its tax revenue. Uh, two major re major reasons other than slavery and perhaps even greater uh, to Lincoln. So when this war's ended, he doesn't really have a personal incentive or a want to punish them. Uh, the radicals, which were in complete control of Congress at this point in time, uh, they wanted as harsh a uh, destruction of the South as possible. Um, uh, this would be Thaddeus Stevens, uh, quite a famous uh, congressman, radical Republican leader, um, and, and then there are a few others you can go and look at yourselves. Um, they are the reason that it took so long for some of the southern states to get readmitted. They are also going to be pushing very unpopular uh, crime legislation in, basically allowing the federal government to police southern states using the army under the guise of cracking down upon paramilitary organizations. Uh, the Klan, obviously, is one of the more famous ones, but there were others uh, that actually took over state governments. Uh, the Red Shirts in South Carolina eventually would do that. Um, very general overview. The South isn't doing well. The railroads are destroyed. You're having famines every now and then. Uh, eventually, they get readmitted, um, and they have a uh, civil rights regime, which this is not a, sort of like a right-wing diction redefining what it was. Um, the federal government was enforcing uh, civil rights, the first uh, wave of civil rights in American history, onto the South to make sure that African-American men uh, could vote. So you start seeing the first Republicans elected in states like Georgia, um, I think South Carolina might have had a couple, Mississippi, um, very sort of uh, party line Republicans for the time, which meant that they were uh, typically protectionists, some of them were free traders, very pro-civil rights, pro-federal involvement in the South, um, pro-carpetbagger. Um, this is your sort of political coalition developing, not popular at all. No one so, in the South is happy. So before we go too far, I think as Southerners, we might be more familiar with the phrase carpetbagger than most. Right. Could you stock, talk about that aspect of Reconstruction? Like you said, we're in these federal zones uh, of, of for Reconstruction. The, the Northern government has occupied the South. They've taken over. Uh, they are basically in charge of all of the governments. Uh, what, what are these carpetbaggers? What's their function in the South? Right, okay, so you have two main groups of uh, Republican support in the South. You have uh, what was called carpetbaggers, um, and these were uh, people from the North that had uh, uh, moved to the South after the war, and the stereotype was, and this usually bears out, pretty accurate stereotype, um, the South had a lot cheaper prices. Um, there was a need for things to be produced like food, shelter, railroads, and everything else. So there was a great profit opportunity. People from the north would go to these southern states and they would bring with them their northern values, be it northern Democrat or northern Republican. For those that don't know, um, and this didn't get fixed with the Civil War, uh, both major parties, Democrat and the younger Republican Party, uh, were divided along geographical lines or cultural lines. Um, so these northerners had their own political philosophy, their own political systems and opinions, very analogous to Californians moving to Texas today because they see a better profit opportunity or living potential there, and they bring with them their values. This is what the northern carpetbaggers, as they were termed, did in the south. Um, Scalawags was the other group, uh, another pejorative. Uh, most people probably don't know what it is, so you probably won't get uh, you know, punched on the street for saying it, but most people probably look at you funny. Um, these were people that were native to the South that had joined the Republicans for one reason or another. They were sort of uh, turncoats, scalawags, traitors, uh, was the typical pejoratives that they would get. Um, these two groups 
um, combined with some extreme pragmatics in the uh, old Democratic Party that was there, combined with African Americans, the new voting bloc, um, formed the Republican uh, stranglehold over a few southern states. That's how it got senators, representatives, governors, um, and this would be self-reinforcing. They would appoint their own friends into power, strengthen civil rights, uh, get more people out to the polls that supported them, suppress the Southerners um, under the guy or the uh, the Democratic Southerners under the guise of uh, voting protection. Typically, the claim was that they were suppressing votes in the South. Uh, and I'm not, once again, not trying to take modern stuff and re-implant it back on the history. This is literally their rhetoric. Um, they would say these evil white Southerners, uh, racist typically, are. Uh, prohibiting uh, voting in the South, and therefore the federal government needs to intervene to help our, uh, help our, you know, the poor people down there that just want to express their opinions. Turns out the poor people down there that want to express their opinions tended to be predominantly Republican. Um, so that's, uh, nothing's popular um, in the South for what the federal government's doing. And we had this, as you mentioned at the beginning, we had a succession of presidents. Lincoln was shot. Johnson, um, who was actually a Tennessean, uh, a Democrat uh, uh, once upon a time, he had joined Lincoln in what was called, I believe, the National Union uh, ticket, uh, sort of mm -hmm. like a coalition ticket in the North. Um, meant to, uh, It was a show, basically. There, there wasn't any actual coalescing of Northern Democrats and Republicans in any meaningful standard, just that they all supported the North or were ambivalent towards the war. And um, Johnson was very unpopular with Congress, um, which is why he's the first president to have the... Uh, uh, have impeachment forwarded against him formally, the first president to do that, um, and it was because he had removed someone in his own cabinet and Congress had earlier passed a law um, saying that they had exclusive oversight over who does and doesn't get fired. Um, most people today, left, right, and center, consider this an overstepping on the uh, part of Congress, um, and typically the normal narrative, which is probably closer to the truth than uh, most would give it credit for, is that uh, the radical Republicans were power hungry, that's a psychological statement. You can make of it what you will, um, but it seems to bear out in their policies. They want full control over all localities in the U.S. They want full control over the executive branch. They're trying to pack the Supreme Court. That's another one that might be a little bit modern and uh, uh, topical, if you will. Um, they want a full, radical, Republican-controlled government to exert the ideals of egalitarianism and then freedom derived from that egalitarianism onto the country. So that's and, uh... using government. And Johnson, he dodges that uh, impeachment by like only one vote, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. So, which is really interesting because a lot of people today look at impeachment and they think, oh, that's an extreme step, right? This is something that, that never happens unless someone commits a real crime, these kind of things. Obviously, that's not the case, right? This guy barely dodged the bullet of, uh, of impeachment with what no one would really consider a crime today at all. And so, uh, you know, the, the idea that this is uh, something that's been kept, you know, completely sacred and only used and deployed in a very specific situation has never been politicized is complete uh, garbage. This is something that uh, that happened not infrequently. Right. Yeah. The, the first time impeachment ever gets used in U.S. history, it's to uh, back up a power grabbing law that a bunch of uh, uh, that a special interest group pushed through Congress to make sure that they could make uh, cut down on their rivalry. Right. Uh, a very sacred tool indeed. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, th that's uh, Johnson. And then he's followed up by Grant, who is initially very popular. Um, not, once again, not necessarily in the South. South is uh, not going to like anyone that comes out of the party system. Um, but once again, is if they're not readmitted uh, from these Reconstruction military regimes, they're not voting, but they're still ruled by whoever gets elected. They're basically treated like military territories, if you want to think of it like that, without getting too specific. Um, so... Grant gets, re uh, gets elected. Um, he's mostly popular in the North. Uh, nothing bad has happened. He has a clean slate. He's a war hero. Um, you know, people knew him. He uh, was considered to be somewhat down to earth, um, not, not a uh, political elite by any stretch of the imagination, or at least that's how his image was presented. And he uses this great springing board uh, instead of like a taking uh, sensible political moves from his perspective, like uniting the nation, making sure that there's not going to be a giant Southern backlash or anything like that. Um, he actually cracks down harder on the South um, after they've been readmitted at this point um, by passing more federal uh, criminal, uh, uh, criminal restrictive laws against paramilitaries, against all these other groups. Um, he starts uh, intensifying railroad policies, giving lands out to railroads who are uh, building across the South and into uh, other parts of the country very unpopular law, and we'll get to that whenever we get to uh, Tilden in 1876. Um, so 
big friends with the railroads. Uh, it eventually comes out that he and a bunch of his friends in the cabinet and uh, who knows else, uh, bureaucrats, uh, all levels of Grant's government basically, um, were involved in several very large and very serious financial um, and land scandals basically. There had been several shell companies that had been supposedly building railroads, land donated to them. They didn't actually exist. Um, there had been basically embezzlement, uh, gold, uh, uh, using government regulations, scares, media, and all the other things to uh, profit off of gold trades. Um, Grant was uh, cashing in on some of this stuff as well. Uh, whether he realized it or not, some people will actually go to this extent and say he didn't realize what he was doing in order to preserve his uh, image. Um, I'll let you guys decide if that's a convincing argument. Um, so he's seen as very corrupt uh, by the end of his second term. He gets reelected um, in between uh, those stories breaking and him just generally angering the South by being more restrictive on it. Um, and 1872, uh, this Grant's reelection, uh, just to stop by there for a couple of seconds. It's interesting because the Democratic Party exists again. Uh, the South is readmitted. Um, and they hold a national convention. Uh, they're not very popular in most of the country. They still have those two sides, Northern and Southern Democrats. Um, and they basically say, we're probably not going to win the election, but we still have to do something. Uh, so what does the Democratic Party do in 1872? Um, it, nominates the, uh, it nominates Horace Greeley, uh, right. who was a leader of the liberal Republican faction. Uh, liberal Republicans were the uh, parts of the Republican Party that wanted to go softer on the South. Uh, Lincoln was somewhere in between a liberal Republican and a moderate. Probably wouldn't go all the way with Greeley, but he definitely was not a radical. Um, Greeley was a staunch protectionist. Um, he was a uh, he was the founder of the main Whig Party newspaper, uh, the former political rival to the Democrats. Um, he was a, he was responsible for employing uh, one Karl Marx to write as its uh, European foreign correspondent, basically, writing on grain prices and whatever else in Europe, while also penning a few very uh, influential articles in the history of Marxism under that newspaper. Uh, so this is the person that the uh, liberal Republicans nominated. So too do the Democrats. Um, Greeley loses. Uh, Grant gets reelected in the landslide. And people in the Democratic Party are not happy um, because some of these people, you know, regardless of political pragmatism, are not, um, they aren't happy with just trying to elect a, uh, a better version of the Republicans. They actually want uh, someone good on the ballot. Whether or not they have a chance of winning, they don't care. It's all, it's about the principle, typically. They're looking uh, for some form of actual opposition as opposed yeah, yeah, to just rubber yeah. stamping whoever the Republicans are handing out. Yeah. Right, exactly. So um, this leads to a relatively small split if you go by vote percentage uh, in the Democratic Party. They were called the straight out Democrats, only existed for a couple of election cycles and then eventually remerged. But um, you know, that, that's a indicative of a wider uh, uh, of a wider issue for the Democrats and that the South is not happy if they just keep going along with whatever uh, Republican politics is, just slightly less of it. So um, the Democrats get uh, swept away in 1872. Grant's scandals finally break to the public in a, a massive fashion. Um, he's seen as a drunk. Uh, that's another thing that starts getting emphasized in the public. Um, and throughout this uh, period of a uh, during the election, and then as things get bad for the Grant administration, uh, what do you do if you want to keep some semblance of power? Well, the Civil War wasn't too long ago. Everyone remembers it. Um, you can just start accusing your opposition of being either actual Confederate sympathizers or closeted Confederate sympathizers. That's a very dirty word. In the 1870s, you get beaten down in the middle of the street if you, are, if you aren't careful with who you're around. Um, so this was a uh, political tactic called waving the bloody shirt. Um, if you want to know why it's called that, there's a, uh, uh, I, I don't think it's actually true, um, but there was a speech given in Congress about the uh, uh, anti clan Enforcement Acts that the federal government was using to police the South, um, under the guise of which it locked up about a thousand uh, political uh, operatives in the South of the Democratic Party. So. Whether that was justified or not, you can uh, come to your own conclusion, not very democratic at all, uh, locking up your opposition under uh, the guise of criminal enforcement. However, um, with the uh, passing of this, uh, of this Klan Act, let me see if I can phrase this correctly here. Um, you had people that were going down to the South and enforcing it, 
and they would come back home either genuinely or for media attention with horror stories about how terrible and barbaric the white Southerners were. Um, and according to one speech given on the floor of Congress, um, might have been a representative, I forget if it was a representative or a senator, um, he said that he, uh, he witnessed uh, someone's bloody shirt upon being whipped by the Klan, and this is why the federal government needs to go and restore order in the South again. Um, papers ran with this story, and people started saying he waved the bloody shirt in Congress, which is where you get the name waving the bloody shirt, accusing people you don't like of being Klansmen, Southern sympathizers, uh, persona non grata, basically, if you want to uh, update that to an intelligible term. Um, and that buys the Grant administration some time. It really polarizes everyone, though. No one really likes the polarization. They had just been through five years of very devastating war. Um, they aren't keen to get back to sectarian politics. Um, so uh, there are people, diehard supporters in the North, that buy into this completely. Over time, it doesn't have that effect, and people start to go against it. It starts to be like a smear tactic. People don't like it. It doesn't play well. So what you're saying is that you know if you're if you're a corrupt kind of post-war profiteering administration who's worried about your electoral chances, you can always just um, you know uh, imprison a bunch of your political opponents, smear all of your opposition with a particularly heinous name, uh, and just hope that that kind of pushes you through to the next election. This is this is actually kind of a, a classic American. Uh, yeah. tactic not not something that's just recently uh, uh, kind of shown up on the stage oh yeah and if you wanted to go back through even earlier elections it's a uh, it's uh, quite the tactic especially if there's a sequence of one-term presidents that no one remembers the name or the sequence of uh, after Jackson and then before the uh, Civil War um, gets used all the time not nearly as drastically because there's no uh, proverbial bloody shirt to wave around then you're just smearing your candidate or the opposing candidate so um, this tactic keeps getting used uh, the radical Republicans in the Grant administration are increasingly seen as very corrupt, profiteering, malicious, um, and uh, power-grabbing monsters, basically. Uh, they lose their base of support in the North, by and large. They don't have the stranglehold over uh, Congress anymore. Uh, they barely even had uh, enough votes to get one off of impeaching a president, so their support never was really total, but it was enough to s certainly reform the country, uh, if you want to use a euphemism. Um, whenever they start to fade, you have factions of the Republican Party and the resurgent Democratic Party um, that increasingly emphasize the need to come together as a nation, uh, we need to rebuild unity, uh, tie the parts of the countries together, uh, which is also a new argument at this point in time for uh, protective tariffs. Um, to make sure that there aren't sections of the country reliant upon specific other foreign powers. Everyone's just going to be producing and exchanging within. Um, so parts of the Republican Party and then minor parts of the Democratic Party get a new resurgence of protective tariffs. This isn't just me being an economic policy uh, a nerd. This is actually a, economic policy plays a much greater role in uh, political debates and government administrations last or two centuries ago than it did any time recently. Um, and that's how you typically won your supporters with economic policy and trade policy. Um, so you get this new resurgence of uh, uh, people wanting protective tariffs. Um, the South, uh, oh, and I forgot to mention this at the start, um, part of the reason it was so impoverished um, was because there was rampant inflation. Um, and then after rampant inflation during the Civil War, um, some places, at least according to mainstream economic history, experienced a money shortage. Um, that's important. For people who uh, particularly know their 1900s history, that's going to lead to yep. populist movements. So um, the mainstream economics history uh, says that there is a money shortage. Um, there are heterodox schools like the Austrians who might dispute that claim or say that it's not as it's uh, being presented. Uh, regardless, that's the mainstream. We don't really need to get into it. People thought that there was a money shortage, and that's what matters. That's what's, uh, um, that's what's going to be making the ballot. Um, for the places that aren't hyperinflated. So you have this sort of dualism of uh, your money's worth less and less, and then also people can't get money. So the worst of both worlds by and large. Um, so with the radical Republicans collapsing, a resurgent Democratic Party uh, is on the horizon. The Republicans are moving towards a much more lenient and uh, liberal stance so long as they get uh, certain protective tariffs for their constituents back at home in the industrial states. Um, and then you have uh, poor Southerners who are Still not really recovering. They get industry for the first time in some areas. I believe uh, 
Uh, Northern Alabama had its iron mines and uh, led to a steel industry there, burgeoning steel industry. Uh, other parts have started to move into textile manufacturing, if I remember correctly, along the rivers still. Um, you start getting uh, people in the South want some of the Northern prosperity. The North was well off at this time. It was uh, by far the place to be in the United States. Uh, New England, uh, the Great Lakes regions, um, you were either going to be a well-off farmer who hasn't experienced warfare in their life, uh, or at least on your farm, uh, or you were going to be a factory worker working for a wage that was uh, much more than what you could get on the farm, or you were going to be owning or managing a factory. You know, that, th those were the main groups at the time, not counting politicians and people who are typically more well-off than everyone else. Um, so with that political landscape in play, you get to the 1876 election. Uh, the Democratic Party no longer really, there are elements, but it's not really divided as it once was. Um, they're certainly never again going to run two independent candidates for Northern Democrats and Southern <laughs> Democrats like they did in the 1850s and uh, 1860s. Uh, so they're, they're under one banner. Um, if I remember correctly, they meet in St. Louis in the, uh, 1876. And the question is, who on earth do we nominate for the presidency? Horace Greeley did not work out. People hated it. Um, we have a, there's an actual chance that the Democratic Party can be in power again after like two decades. So what, what do we do? Well, uh, most of the people that were for, up for consideration were Northerners, uh, or non-Southerners, basically, uh, were the vast majority of the slate. I think there were like six candidates, one from New Jersey, Pennsylvania, which I believe was Winfield Scott Hancock was on the ballot. Um, you had Samuel Tilden, who's sort of going to be the star of what we're going to be discussing. He was the governor of New York. Famously anti-corruption, had a very clean administration, uh, pro-gold standard. Um, yeah, got uh, got rid of Boss Tweed, right? That that was one of his uh, achievements. It was uh, Tweed and uh, a couple other people. It was the canal ring uh, was mm -hmm. one of the things that he was famous for busting up. Um, and this would, uh, he was ahead of his time, if you want to use a overused historical way of looking at it. Um, this was sort of the... Uh, northern mid-atlantic politics that would actually go on to win the presidency a few times later but that's jumping ahead a little bit uh clean guy anti-corruption he supported a uh, uh sort of like a very stable conservative money supply that would eventually work its way throughout the country uh sort of like organically solve the problem um he, he was by far the popular one there uh, a few other people i think there was a guy running from ohio and uh maybe georgia um so those are your options there was a Georgian on the ballot, did not get very far at all. Um, Tilden wins, I think, after two rounds. Um, eventually, the entire uh, committee supports him. Uh, they launch fireworks off from, uh, uh, like, the old courthouse in St. Louis. I don't know which one for any St. Louisans that are going to press me on that later. I just know that there was a fireworks display, which is a very fancy thing to see in the 1870s. So um, they're happy. Things are looking really optimistic. Um, and the Republicans... They don't have as much of a crowded primary, if I remember correctly. It's uh, uh, Rutherford B. Hayes versus a, a few other uh, Civil War and bureaucratic people. Um, he eventually wins, if I remember correctly, as a sort of compromise candidate. Yeah, um, what I was looking into, it looks like there, you know, because obviously uh, there was questions on whether Grant would run for a third term. And so it, right. it, it and, and Hayes wasn't really well known outside of his state. Uh, so it looked like it, it took, you know, five, six, seven rounds of, of voting before right. they finally kind of came to a compromise on him. Right, because uh, one of the dynamics you still had in the Republican Party during this primary was uh, you had the waning radical Republicans. They obviously had their uh, special boy that they wanted to get the presidency. Um, you had the more liberal factions that were uh, more conciliatory towards the South. And then you had Rutherford B. Hayes, who was the dark horse candidate, the compromise, um, where after neither side could agree, they just chose this nobody, if I remember correctly, from Ohio. Yeah. Um, and he was, a, he was a war veteran, saw the Civil War. Um, he had a pretty, you know, no one disliked him, really. He didn't really have any opposition, so that's a great compromise candidate if your party's about to split in half. So um, he's the uh, Republican nominee, a uh, little bit more protectionist. Once again, they have their constituents in the North um, who are much more industrial. They have to compete with foreign markets. They don't like it. They want protective tariffs. Um, they also have a political uh, economy uh, history of being for tariffs. That, that was the entire Federalist movement was a very sort of insular, uh, Federalist in the Whigs, very insular, economically developed using some state intervention uh, at home. The Democrats, by contrast, have always been much more free trade oriented. Um, this was uh, especially obvious in the South, but now after the Civil War, 
Um, the South is still agricultural, it's trying to get industry. Um, and to do this, it needs access to one, foreign markets. Uh, tariffs actually hurt those at this point in time because uh, you, know, you don't have a credit card or the internet to make trades with. You actually have to build up credit with other people if you're going to use that kind of business. Tariffs hurt that because you can't then buy from them using that. It's uh, going to be more expensive. Um, so they're more free trade oriented. They also need to, uh, uh, well, actually, they don't need to. They are going to run on anti-corruption, um, specifically because everyone hated it. It was a winning issue. They had multiple Democratic candidates that were against corruption. Um, they were willing to basically sideline their political machines in the North, uh, which is why Samuel Tilden was so popular. He had opposition, if I remember correctly, from uh, Honest John Kelly, who was a political boss. Uh, the honest in his name is, uh, is a pejorative given to him. It was not a, uh, an actual, real, truthful name. Um, however, these political bosses were sidelined by this point. The Democratic Party is ready to go for you know, a gold standard, um, be a little bit more oriented towards free trade. Um, they're ready to end Reconstruction in the South. Tilden was the northerner, governor of New York. Um, he can't just ignore the South. That's still the by far the ma uh, the uh, South or the uh, Democratic Party's uh, political base. You have to do what they want, whether you like it or not. If I remember correctly, I think Tilden was just in favor of getting the federal government out of the South, anyways. Um, you still had a sort of a, a decentralist uh, sort of Calhounite tradition in the Democratic Party at this point, um, and outside of ending Reconstruction, uh, anti-corruption, uh, free trade. Uh, you also had a uh, more, I don't know what you call it, a more conciliatory uh, approach. Uh, the Democratic Party was not going to be uh, uh, LARPing as a uh, confederacy in the United States. They were going to be trying to run for the whole country, uh, sort of have a national campaign. This was uh, unpopular with more radical elements in the South, um, but you know, this is uh, where political pragmatism perhaps uh, plays a bigger role than ideals and uh, uh, morality in politics. So. Um, that's the stage for the 1876 election. Those are your two runners. Um, anyone that's seen a list of U.S. presidents knows that Samuel Tilden is uh, not a president. He's right. virtually unknown to anyone. He does not win. Um, why doesn't he win? Well, <laughs> he loses the state of South Carolina, according to the official history textbooks that we have after Hayes won. Uh, he loses the state of South Carolina by, I think, like a couple hundred votes, um, which... Anyone in vote counting or political theory, political science, uh, ethics, knows that a couple hundred votes in a general election typically could mean um, something was going on there. Very rarely do you get a margin that tiny um, and not have both sides wanting to investigate it to either strengthen their margin or uh, flip the state. Uh, so South Carolina um, is dealing, uh, why did it almost flip? South Carolina typically seems like the Democratic secessionist southern state the most conservative one in the country perhaps uh, why is it split 50 50 between the republicans who have just occupied the south for who knows how long and the democrats who are you know basically just giving south carolina's platform to the country uh or in a moderate sense at least well <laughs> like we mentioned or like i mentioned at the beginning those civil rights regimes that they were propping up by the military they weren't just vanished after the South got readmitted to the Union, after Grant's administration started to lose grasp on what was happening. Um, those, that uh, political block of uh, scalawags, carpetbaggers, um, African Americans, and uh, uh, pragma pragmatists basically still existed um, in most Southern states. Uh, oh, hold on, sorry. Uh, including um, South Carolina still had that coalition going. If you look at the map, it's typically in the black areas of South Carolina uh, that voted for the G for the Republicans, and it was typically the wider areas um, that voted for the Democrats plus the urban uh, the urban areas. Urban areas were typically controlled uh, by the more um, old ar aristocratic types. Uh, the old Southern uh, political bosses still had control over most urban areas, uh, with few major exceptions, and this leads to a national outrage. Um, because the Civil War is in recent memory, not even living memory. Most of these people remember fighting against the other side. Um, you have another election that is very, very close, um, divided along geographic lines once again with uh, uh, you know, Tilden carrying a few places in the North. Um, but obviously the South goes Democratic, um, and then the uh, North goes mostly Republican, generalizing here so that people get an idea of what's going on. 
and we have a flashpoint. Is the country just going to dissolve now? Yeah, so so as I understand it, it's, it's even more contentious because, you know, Til Tilden wins the popular vote by a, by a good right. margin. Like that that's not even in question, right? I, I think right. I saw it's 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 almost it's almost 51% of the vote, which is the widest amount that any presidential candidate has ever won the popular vote by and not been given the presidency. It's more than Hillary Clinton, it's more than, you know, Al Gore. It, it's it's uh it's a wide margin that he wins this by. And also, it's not just South Carolina, Florida and Louisiana also, you know, uh, are, are contested. Both parties are claiming that they've kind of won the uh, the Electoral College vote there. So Tilden's got a good 20 vote plus lead in the Electoral yeah. College. But these three states all kind of, you know, uh, South Carolina, uh, you know, maybe the flashpoint here. But there, there's three states that are all contested. Uh, with that and then also i believe one state didn't even have it got its elector replaced right and so yeah. that that threw everything else into uh right and none of the stuff ever really gets mentioned in any history textbooks including your good ap textbooks no one usually cares about this because they usually just see um crazy things happen and then it gets resolved later we'll get to that in a second um but you are right uh, and the reason i'm focusing on south carolina in particular um, is because South Carolina during the last few uh, Republican uh, administrations uh, was basically targeted. Um, so the, the uh, various enforcement acts, the uh, anti-Klan acts and all this other stuff was specifically used to uh, wrest control over states like South Carolina, uh, where paramilitaries, not the Klan, but uh, once again the Red Shirts, I believe, replaced a governor. Um, you had uh, you know, probably credible attempts at restricting the franchise in at least a few small areas. Um, South Carolina was a state that was uh, basically taken back in its uh, Democratic Party infrastructure through force or through intimidation, uh, if most accounts are to be believed, and I'm sure there's room for revisionism there, but um, it's a flashpoint because there has been stuff going on there basically the, since Reconstruction started. Um, you had like a, basically a low-level guerrilla war as soon as Reconstruction was implemented there. Um, you had, after that sort of died down, then you had a uh, wave of uh, extremely populist militias. Um, and then you get to the election, South Carolina, and then as you mentioned, Florida, um, and uh, Georgia, was it? If I, remember I think it's correctly. Louisiana is the other Louisiana. one. Louisiana, okay. Yeah, yeah so um, these states have uh, potential discrepancies. Tilden's already, Tilden's the popular candidate by far. He was the one known most uh, widely. Uh, people had a positive opinion towards him. He was seen as a good... Uh, uh, sort of like a good way for the Democratic Party to reemerge into American life if it wasn't just your number one option. Anyways, as we mentioned earlier, Rutherford B. Hayes uh, was a compromise candidate. He wasn't running this giant national uh, platform. He wasn't run He wasn't some great, renowned war hero that everyone knew about. He was just the guy that the GOP chose <clears throat> because they needed to unite their party, prevent uh, what what happened, prevent happening to them what happened to the Democrats a few decades earlier. So, Tilden wins the popular vote. <clears throat> There's a lot of, uh, um, as you mentioned, uh, very shady things that went on with how the Electoral College was being handled. One guy got replaced. A few people were supposedly bribed by Northern money. Um, you had a few people who were uh, um, just, if I remember correctly, not even supposed to be there, but declared themselves like the representative for that state based off of some uh, strange and non-legitimate claim, quite frankly. Um, so, once again, what's going to happen? Uh, foreign or outsiders were saying the country might just dissolve at this point. They've uh, had a few years where they occupied the rebelling regions. Um, they tried to bring them back into the fold. They put up an actual political fight, um, and it looks like shady shenanigans on who knows what side. You know, it's happening at the time, 1870s media technology. You don't have people recording on their phones what's happening at the polls. Makes it to the newspapers. Everyone thinks that uh, you know both sides are pulling some sort of trick down there, and uh, you know. If I remember correctly, I think a lot of the English and Scottish and uh, continental Europeans thought that there was a good chance that the uh, country could just dissolve. Um, yeah, it's certainly a, a time of crisis for sure, right? Like you said, you're only a decade removed from a civil war. You have a military occupation of your former, uh, you know, uh, kind of countrymen. You know, you're, you're kind of completely remaking the economic apparatus. There's wide, uh, uh, wide uh, accusations of corruption and everything else. Obviously, it's a terrible time to have an electoral, uh, you know, inconsistency make people doubt the legitimacy of the election. 
Now, before we move on to kind of the solution here, I do want to address the fact, if you look at most history books that do actually address this, and like you said, most don't. Most just be like, some crazy stuff happened, and then they compromised, and then the next thing happened. They don't really get into this at all. But those that do address it usually say something like, okay, well, clearly Tilden was winning by a lot. Like, he was winning the popular vote. He was winning the Electoral College. But the big thing is, uh, the oppression of uh, the black vote, right? That, that there was a there was a concerted effort across all of these states, a violent one uh, that you know usually it's you know talk about you know, hundreds of people killed trying to vote that kind of thing, and so this is why it's okay that Tilden was kind of basically removed from the presidency, denied the presidency because really the you know there was uh, there was this kind of uh, violent suppression of legitimate voting in the south and so that's why like basically none of their their votes could really be trusted and it's okay if if they couldn't uh if they weren't actually tabulated so i mean i'm sure there absolutely was a, a level of suppression you know these things are very real to some extent but the question is like does that invalidate i guess for people and i'm not asking i'm not asking you to to make a moral judgment on that but i think that's just something for people to think about when they think about the legitimacy of the election. Basically, if you look at the honest historical textbook, they're like, well, yeah, obviously Tilden won, but there was violent suppression of voting in the South to some degree. And so discarding basically of their votes and just handing it to the Republicans was more or less like, okay, like that was, that was on the, uh, on the up. Right. And um, so, yeah, there, there's that uh, question for people to ponder. Another one that might go alongside of it sort of as a uh, cor uh, color corollary um, you know, uh, can you point to any election in United States history that did not have this voter suppression that would invalidate the whole result? That would be a sort of like, can you consistently apply the standard? Um, and then the sort of counter to that historical narrative that other people have developed, once again, I do uh, very little original research. Uh, most of my stuff is taken from a few people uh, from typically revisionist uh, backgrounds. But um, the, the actual counter that was given at the time and then uh, was taken elsewhere um, was that, well, actually, there's a pretty plausible uh, standard here that, you know, maybe there wasn't voter suppression and the sort of old Republican uh, coalition just didn't like the Republicans after the Grant administration. You had uh, um, the Grant administration and then the various uh, civil rights administrations in the South, the uh, uh, various Republican local administrations. They were also very corrupt. Um, quite a few of the uh, uh, because of the way that they got into the office, because they were being so promoted heavily by the GOP and whatever else, um, quite a few of the first uh, black administrations on the state level uh, were exceedingly corrupt, very nepotistic. Um, they had quite a few financial scandals um, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, this created sort of like a uh, divide that many of us have with our own politicians among this uh, uh, once upon a time presumed uh, homogenous black voting bloc, um, where you know, there were normal, poor black farmers now that had land, and their politicians that were supposed to be representing them in uh, whichever state that they were in um, are just using the office to get rich, promote their family and friends, and then get out of there as soon as things hit the fan. That's not what they want. That's not what anyone really wants, unless you're on the receiving end of that, uh, of that patronage. So um, there is a convincing argument that, you know, um, sure, there was racial conflicts in, in these recorded uh, places, but it's also perfectly plausible that the vote just flipped. You know, people can only take so much corruption at this point in time. Uh, maybe modern media has desensitized us to the uh, scale and uh, depravity of, the, of our, our current corruption. Um, in the 1870s, this was a pretty big thing. People were still traditional, very religious. Um, the black communities in particular, as uh, Stephen Carson and I have been covering on his channel, um, they were very tight-knit, uh, very independent. Um, they had their own mutual aid societies, their own uh, church congregations, and whatever else. Um, these aren't exactly the type of people that just want to be represented by corrupt, uh, nepotistic uh, philanderers in some state capital. Perfectly plausible that they flipped. Uh, once again, this isn't for you or I to make an absolute verdict on was there um, you know, enough voter suppression to invalidate the state results, much less the entire election. Um, but the country can't agree on it, and it takes until 1877, if I remember correctly, to actually come to, con uh, sorry, come to a conclusion uh, on any meaningful scale. And you have 
various militias in the South, and if I remember correctly, I think that there were some in the North threatening violence if Tilden didn't get the presidency, um, which is uh, where you get the famous saying, Tilden or blood. Um, you have the famous political cartoon with the hand on the table with a Tilden ticket and then a revolver. Um, very powerful imagery. Um, Tho Bishop, if anyone's interested in this specific uh, part of the election in the American history, he, uh, Tho Bishop of the uh, Ludwig von Mises Institute, he's pretty good on this. He gave a uh, lecture on it, I think, a year ago. Um, goes into a little bit more detail than we are now. Um, but people were getting violent. Things had not been going well for the South at all. They're having a uh, the threat of an election being stolen from them for the first time that they've won back power in a, a couple of decades. Um, so what happens is party representatives from the GOP um, and the Democratic Party uh, meet together behind closed doors, not exaggerating, secret political meeting, um, and they determine who is going to get the presidency. Um, we don't have very much detail exactly on what happened here. Um, it's a closed door meeting, that's their nature. And I wish as a historian that we did, but uh, you know, they wouldn't happen if people just knew what was going on. Turns out the smoke-filled room still had a lot of power there. Yeah, yeah, and uh, <laughs> might still to this day if you open your eyes up a little bit. Right. Um, so um, these representatives get in the room, um, and Tilden, through one means or another, uh, some say he acquiesced, some say he like argued it out, um, Tilden eventually ends up conceding, despite the fact he had the popular, had a very strong argument for the presidency. Um, and he gives the presidency to Hayes, he and his representatives give the presidency to Hayes on four conditions. And these conditions are that Hayes and the GOP um, must pull troops out of the South. They have to end Reconstruction entirely, get the military administrations out. Um, they have to uh, help industrialize the South through favorable legislation. Um, this is a part of a New South policy, which is a, anyone that remembers your American history class, that was usually like a vocab word or something in bold. You had to remember what the New South was. Uh, well, this is that policy um, being implemented in some serious way during this uh, corrupt bargain or the uh, uh, great bargain or whatever you want to call it. The uh, Compromise of 1877 uh, has a variety of names. Uh, this is where that starts to get implemented. Um, you also have a, uh, <clears throat> you have a uh, demand that Hayes appoints at least one Democrat, I forget if the, it was explicitly a Southern Democrat or not, to his cabinet um, so that there's some sort of a, uh, a bipartisan government there. Um, and then you also have the demand that a railroad be constructed through the South across the continent. So this is where you get your Texas to Pacific uh, transcontinental railroad line. Uh, that, that was the terms. Tilden gave up the presidency, um, wasn't going to fight it, wasn't going to raise up militia and cross the Rubicon or any of this other uh, grand ambitious plans. Uh, he gave it up on those four points and Rutherford B. Hayes, uh, quite famously or infamously, depending on who you are, pulled the troops out of the South. Uh, most of the South reverted to a very strong Democratic Party uh, stronghold afterwards. People will say this is obviously proof of voter suppression. Um, other people will have various counters to that, like the one that I just gave you. Um, that's what happens as a sort of long-term consequence, and it will carry on up until about the 1960s or so, whenever they start to flip red um, after the New Deal coalition and its Southern Democratic accomplices uh, start to lose popularity. So this lasts for a long time, almost 100 years, the consequences of this. Um, you get your uh, transcontinental railroad, if I remember correctly, in some capacity. Um, I know there's a story there, I think that there are a bunch of delays and political battles over it, but um, you eventually do get major railroad lines going through the south, um, though nowhere near the north. In fact, that's a uh, talking point during the uh, 68 election when you had George Wallace running uh, as a uh, sort of a southern, more uh, law and order, nationalistic type candidate. Um, he would make great emphasis on television shows, uh, Buckley's firing line and whatever else that the South had been suppressed ever yeah. since the end of the Civil War um, because the federal government would prevent railroads and industries and whoever else from building there. And then the railroads that did build there would uh, sort of cartelize, uh, form a cartel and charge fares uh, into the South. So to keep them uh, keep things deliberately expensive to ship in and out of the South. So that all dates back to here. Um, the political appointee, I think, was like the postmaster general or something like that, uh, a very... Dog catcher, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. So um, their Southern Democratic appointee uh, did not get very much uh, political power. Granted, the postmaster general had a little bit more, uh, like, real hard power, or not hard power, but, like, real tangible power at that point in time. 
um, because post is how things will get transmitted, if not by telegraph, which even then the postmaster um, had regulatory capabilities over. So, you know, it's important, but it's not the Secretary of State or of the Treasury or of War or, you know, any of the major uh, departments. So um, they got something there. Um, and then the uh, legislation to help uh, industrialize the South kind of happens, um, but it's kind of presented to the South as a, um, the federal government will push you along, but then the states are going to have to uh, pull the majority of the weight using their own budgets. Um, this will lead to the Democratic Party um, becoming very fiscally uh, conservative, almost libertarian, um, because this sort of uh, state subsidized industrialization doesn't work as well as it was promised. And there's a lot of waste that gets publicized. Um, people don't like that, especially poor white and black farmers. Um, they don't like seeing that city people are taxing them and then frivolous, frivolously spending that money nominally to industrialize their state. So um, that has ramifications on the Democratic Party. Um, Samuel Tilden also himself has uh, an effect on the Democratic Party going forward. He was a protege of Martin Van Buren, uh, Andrew Jackson's running mate, uh, very uh, strong, hard money advocate, gold standard. Uh, I don't remember if he was entirely free trade or if he was somewhere in the middle. I think he was, though. Uh, sort of like a um, traditional economics, have sound money, uh, be able to trade with people, and you'll be prosperous. Um, very much opposed to the northern, uh, protect your uh, industry, nurture them, and make sure they can outcompete other countries. Um, Tilden sort of reemphasizes that within the Democratic Party after they had nominated Horace Greeley, who was a strong protectionist, uh, very much in that Whig Republican camp, being as he himself was a Whig. Um, so the Democratic Party going forward will start emphasizing those things. The Republican Party, in contrast, will become much more protectionist, uh, much more industrial focused, has much uh, greater ramifications whenever William McKinley is the nominee um, in the 1900s, eventually uh, getting shot <laughs> and leading to the progressives having right. their first presidency with Roosevelt and then the uh, two that came after him. So uh, this one election obviously has a lot of uh, modern political uh, tie-ins, <laughs> disputing uh, corrupt bargains. You have voter suppression, supposedly, civil rights regimes that have been propped up to uh, either artificially or uh, righteously uh, get the correct people to the polls. Um, but then you also have actual historical consequences, like the character of the two parties going forward. Um, you know, indirectly planting the seeds for uh, the start of the progressive era through a complete accident. Um, very important part of American history that gets skipped over the textbooks. Absolutely. And yeah, that, that's why I wanted to have you on today to talk about it, because, again, I feel like this is something that basically no one learns about. Every even most most textbooks just skip over and uh, they look at the events of today and they say, oh, these are unique. This is something we've never seen before. This is you know, the, the American, a time of crisis that that's never seen before. Now, obviously, we are talking about a time of serious American crisis. Right? It's right after the Civil War. Like we said, many people asked, was was this going to be the end of the United States with this kind of electoral, uh, you know, kind of question being thrown into the middle of things uh, this close to a separation of the Union and a, and a clash of uh, the states? So uh, obviously being compared to this time isn't great for our time either. Uh, but 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 it does let us know that this is not the only time that the country has faced something like this. There is precedent for this kind of thing. And so I think it is really important to understand uh, these these pieces of lost history. So, uh, Ryan, I really want to thank you for coming on. Is there anything that people should be checking out? Uh, you got anything coming up? I know you've been a little busy, but I didn't know if uh, there's anything that you wanted to let people know about. Oh, well, uh, th thank you very much for having me on. It's always a pleasure to actually talk about just the, the history of things. And uh, uh, that's genuinely my favorite interest. But um, as for my stuff, um, you can find me uh, on YouTube uh, under the name Ryan Turnipseed. There's a channel there. I have a few interviews and discussions with people that go a little bit long for some people's tastes, but um, covering also uh, world history topics as well as United States history topics, some religious and cultural uh, issues as well. Um, Ryan Turnipseed on YouTube, and then you can find me on Twitter, or X, I guess, as it's called now. Uh, that might be a good stream for some people to revisit, see how accurate things were. It was the uh, prediction stream that we had on here a while ago. Yeah. Um, you can find me on Twitter, or X, at uh, Turnip Merchant, uh, all one word. Uh, also, just my username is my real name, so Ryan Turnipseed, uh, surprisingly in dispute for some groups of people. Um, you can find me there. 
Um, and typically, if you reach out to me, I will uh, talk to you so long as you aren't just uh, openly and directly insulting me for no reason. I've had that happen a few times before. Keep the door open anyways. Um, and besides that, you can also find a few of my articles uh, being put on uh, Mises.org and BlueRockwell.com now. So I have a few pieces over there. Uh, that's where you can find the majority of my stuff if anyone's interested. Fantastic. Yeah, make sure you're checking out Ryan's work. And of course, if this is your first time on this channel, make sure that you go ahead and subscribe. If you'd like to get these broadcasts as podcasts, make sure that you go ahead and follow the Orrin McIntyre Show on your favorite pod, pod, podcast platform. When you do, go ahead and leave a rating or review. It really helps with the algorithm. Uh, so guys, tomorrow is supposed to be the Republican uh, kind of... Uh, uh, there's the Republican debate here. I don't know what's going to happen kind of after after the Tucker Carlson interviews. I feel like that's that's the best you're going to get after, uh, you know, as opposed to a normal presidential primary debate. Uh, you're going to have eight, nine guys standing on stage fighting for the same sound bite. But either way, uh, we'll we'll be commenting on it over at The Blaze. Uh, I'll be on The Blaze TV joining the live chat talking about that. So if you want to check that out, you can make sure to do so. Thanks for coming by, guys. And as always, I will talk to you next time.